Today's topic is male infertility with Georgie Dinkoff. We are going to be talking about why there's been such a decline in male infertility throughout the years and what you can do about it. Make sure you stick around to the end where Sarah and I kind of ramble, but provide our own insights and wrap up discussion about action items and main takeaways for improving male infertility. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Rooted in Resilience podcast. Today, we are joined again with our friend Georgie, and we are talking all about male fertility. So Georgie sent us a few articles before starting the podcast, and one of the most alarming statistics that he sent was close to 50% of young couples are infertile or have a hard time conceiving and having children that just doesn't seem natural. Like our biology Mm -hmm. wasn't designed to have a 50% failure rate (laughs) of conceiving. So in today's podcast, we're going to discuss with Georgie kind of the the stats, the facts, reasons for poor male fertility, and some of the things that you males can do to improve your fertility because males are 50% of the picture. So males got to get their shit together. That's right. <laughs> so I agree. Jordan, what what are some of the what are some of the facts and the alarming statistics um, behind the male infertility crisis? So some of the first signs we're seeing actually in the uh, mid seventies, some some urologists started uh, you know raising the alarm that they're seeing a lot of people with uh, um, subnormal or, or they call or they call it less than normal, less than optimal testosterone levels. Um, but for a long time, the you know the medical profession refused to recognize that. You know, testosterone, other than being the aggression hormone, which actually turns out to be a lie, turns out that men with high testosterone are not aggressive, they're actually calm, assertive, and capable, and, and capable of stopping aggression. Estrogen is the uh, hormone behind aggression. But, you, you know, those early alarms that were being raised uh, were usually dismissed with the expression of, like, oh, so what? We're going to have males with lower testosterone. It's better for society. We're going to have less crime, right? Um, well, it turns out that testosterone is actually very important for male fertility because the sperm count and the sperm motility is directly controlled by not, not just the absolute amounts of testosterone a male produces, but by the androgen to the estrogen ratio. And since testosterone is the dominant androgen in males, you can actually kind of approximate that by the testosterone to the estrogen ratio in males. And that ratio has been precipitously dropping uh, since the 1970s. Um, you know, the studies that I, that I showed you, as scary as they are, they only look at half of the picture. They're looking at the decline of the testosterone levels. And that decline, basically, uh, is in the range of 30 to 40% since 1973. Uh, sperm count is down more than 60%, 6 since 1973. And actually, the study that I sent you, the, the, the study at the, the period that they looked at was 1973 2011. So we have another 12 years on top of that. And the trends that I sent you on the other articles are that this is continuing. So by now, we'll probably have 70 to 80% decline in sperm count and probably 60 to 70 percent, 60 to 70 decline in testosterone levels. And these things go in parallel, which perfectly corroborates the original hypothesis of that urologist in the 1970s who said, hey, declining testosterone levels in males are alarming. This is not going to end well, right? We need to do something about it. And that guy was dismissed. He was told, just go about your business. We're going to have less aggressive males. Like, who doesn't want that, right? Uh, well, it turns out that nobody wants that, including the women. Um, nobody wants to be. Uh, I, mean, I don't. I don't, don't want to say that there's a stereotypical role of the male, but I think a, a calm, assertive, strong, capable male is something that most heterosexual females would like. Um, a male that sits around and whines all day uh, and is always in touch with their feelings and just whining about everything all the time, which is what low testosterone does do, because it allows estrogen to run unopposed. Um, is something that most people would not want to be, right? The, the male will probably not want it themselves to be that way, and the females would not want to be around such a male. So, but that's the situation we have right now. And then that last link that I sent you, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of the scary, the scariest that I've seen so far, because usually if you if you Google around, say, what percentage of couples cannot get pregnant these days, the mass media will give you a percentage between 1 in 5 to 1 in 4, so 20 to 25%. But if you look at the official link, which is from a study on PubMed, and actually this this is the article published on NIH's website, National Institute of Health, so government official data, uh, in, a, in a very nefarious way, twist the wording around, but you can actually calculate yourself, saying 40 to 60%, 40 to 60% of young couples can 
are capable of getting pregnant naturally. So the average of 40 and 60 is 50. That's another way of saying 50% cannot get naturally pregnant uh, without artificial help, which is in vitro, you know, some kind of fertility stimulating drugs, such as, uh, by the way, the, 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 the fertility stimulating uh, components are also very dangerous themselves, like clomiphene, which is what women get pumped full of. Um, but even in that case, usually the focus is on the woman, right? Um, it's like, okay, even though it could be a male infertility, the way they're treating her is saying like, oh, as long as you have one viable sperm, <laughs> we're going to, uh, to, uh, to like turn your partner, female partner into a ridiculously fertile goddess. And even this one viable sperm will be able to fertilize her, to impregnate her, right? But they're not doing anything for the male part. And the reason is they're saying they don't know what to do, right? They're saying we don't know what's causing the decline in, in male fertility. Well, there's plenty of literature published saying that the decline of testosterone levels is the primary cause. Combined, which is something that's not being talked about, is the also rise of estrogen levels, because that's what happens when testosterone levels decline. Or at the very least, the test when the testosterone to estrogen ratio declines, the male will be in a sort of so-called of estrogen, a relative estrogenic dominance. Um, and that is really, really uh, you know, detrimental to male fertility. In fact, back in the day, uh, sexual offenders in some countries to this day are given the choice. You go to jail, male sexual offenders, or you undergo chemical castration, which is done by injecting them with either estrogen and or a synthetic progestin. And they actually measure their sperm count and the testosterone levels, and, and they continue with these treatments until these things are down in the drain, which is where they are naturally <laughs> for most males in Western societies. Uh, so estrogen is very, very bad for, for male fertility. Uh, it's actually very bad for female fertility as well, but it's less talked about. Uh, it does have a role in ovulation, uh, and, and, and basically medicine kind of latches onto that to say that estrogen is the female hormone. It's absolutely crucial. Without estrogen, you cannot get pregnant. That is not true. Uh, in fact, progesterone is the pregnancy hormone, and progesterone is what's given to women who are pregnant in, the, in order to maintain the baby. You give them too much estrogen, they abort. Um, so... Again, back to male infertility, declining testosterone levels and, and combined with rising estrogen levels. And on top of that, uh, there's a rise, of course, of the exposure to endocrine disruptors, which are everywhere around us. Uh, some of them are synthetic, uh, especially coming from plastics and, you know, kind of like a byproduct of many of the chemical and the petrochemical industry. Um, uh, but uh, some of them are actually natural. Um, and the natural ones, even though most people don't think of them as endocrine disruptors, are the polyunsaturated fats. No matter what we talk about, you know, this comes down to the polyunsaturated fats. Uh, and people say, no, it's, you're just, uh, you know, you, you, you're a fanboy for, you know, saturated fats. You just keep bashing the PUFA. What does PUFA have to do with infertility? Well, there is a component in one PUFA oil uh, called Gossypol, G-O-S-S-Y-P-O-L, uh, and it's a component of cotton seed oil, but also several other seed oils. And if you look at it, it's been studied over the last 20 years as a male infertility pill. Um, so there's a naturally present sterilizing agent in several of these seed oils that are being sold on the market. Uh, now, since the, the public kind of got a wind of that, the, the presence of that infertility agent, I think now they're starting to filtering it out. But uh, several studies that I posted on my blog over the last couple of years demonstrated that just the pure polyunsaturated fat by themselves, um, when they're fed to a pregnant woman, can basically produce an infertile male offspring uh, if the woman eats a lot of puffo during pregnancy. And if they're given in a sufficiently high amount to regular healthy males, whether children or adults, they're going to render them infertile. The problem is that with prolonged consumption, uh, the polyunsaturated fats can actually damage structurally the gonads and may potentially cause partially irreversible infertility. Estrogen works in the exact same way and it's not a coincidence. The polyunsaturated fats and estrogen very largely overlap in terms of their uh, physiological effects in the male organism. So that's really the, the cause and of course the stress uh, the, that everybody is experiencing um, and stress is kind of known to have like a at least indirectly to infertility in medical circles they they know that people who are males who are chronically depressed uh, may have a much higher rate of infertility than the general population but of course then the link the, the actual mechanism of action is is uh, considered unknown just as you found right we don't know what to do about it because the cause is unknown well when you're depressed your cortisol and your serotonin are high so is estrogen and every every single one of these is actually an, an infertility agent in both males and females 
Um, if you give the multiple studies show that if you give cortisol to males or females, the, the females never go into ovulation. They, can, they, they never produce a viable egg. If you give cortisol to males, their testosterone levels plummet. Uh, they start getting fat. They lose interest in not only females, but even food. Uh, and basically, they just become like, a, you know, a semi-dead blobs of fat running around, not in, really interested in anything. So it reminds you of anybody, the couch, infamous couch potato phenotype. That's actually a male who is either chronically stressed or uh, he's fed on high polyunsaturated fat diet or he's taking an, a serotonergic antidepressant uh, or he's, he's, you know, bathing all day in endocrine disruptors. And unfortunately for most males, it's a combination of one or more of these factors. So it's really no surprise that we're here. In fact, I'm surprised that the percentage is not even higher, which kind of tells me that the population that we're seeing, it, uh, you know, fertility-wise, things have kind of almost split the way we're seeing politically. We have a population that lives like in the heartland of the country. They're more traditional, more in touch with nature, more intuitive, more you try to eat, you know, more than the way their ancestors did. And you have the, you know, coastal cities and other large urban centers where basically, uh, you know, technocracy rules and um, the males there are being decimated. Uh, and the females too. I mean, I, I don't want, I, I don't want to make it sound like it's it's a paradise for females there. But both males and females are being decimated by a combination of extremely crappy diet. Um, endocrine disruptors, chronic stress, right? Almost inescapable because if you live in a city and that's your whole life, where are you going to go? You feel like you can't even survive out in the sticks. Um, so, you know, that's the, the combination of these things. And it, we're seeing 50-50, and that's pretty much how the country is split right now. Uh, half of the country is in the cities, half of the country is in, you know, out in the heartland, and these two sides are irreconcilable with each other politically, and now as we can see, physiologically as well. Uh, it's just the way things are going, the, the technocratic lifestyle um, kind of really blurs the lines between males and females. It's not a coincidence that most of the transgenderism is seen in the big cities. A lot of people say, no, it's because it's tolerated there. It's not only tolerated there more, it's actually the environment there is more conducive to producing it. Uh, m most people will say that, you know, people with, uh, you know, uh, transgender tendencies are, are born this way, but multiple studies going back to the 1960s have demonstrated that clinically, you pick an animal model, there is an established protocol for inducing transgenderism or, you know, um, uh, sex ambiguity um, and even homosexual behavior. All of these things are actually known to be chemically inducible in animals. Uh, now, a lot of people will counter that when they say, well, we don't know how much of this translates to people, but... If it, if it happens, if it works in mice, if it works in rats, if it works in pigs, works in rabbits, and works in monkeys, then to me, this is proven, it works in humans until proven otherwise. So that's where we're at. Basically, the male has been decimated. And I know that's a very politically correct statement to say because all we hear in media is that more power to women. I agree more power to women, but it shouldn't be by decimating the male. You know, these men and women need each other. If you decimate the male, I don't think the females will do very well either. Yeah, it's so the studies that you sent, I think it's important for people to remember that when you perform a study where you're analyzing like previous years, you can't study like current year data. It's yeah. in the past. And so these statistics that Georgie said, this is from like 2000 up to 2010, up to 2012. Yeah. We are now a decade past that and things are probably getting much worse, but you don't see these things happening with animals right like on our farm yeah we don't talk about 50 percent failure in <laughs> them producing babies like it's just natural and it's happening because we're not interfering with the natural biological processes whereas now in america you see these just alarming rates so for a couple a young couple mm -hmm. for the male what would be like the best blood work to assess his fertility, I guess. Oh, very simple. I mean, uh, total testosterone, not free. I emphasize total testosterone because that is the metric of how well the gonads are working. And usually, basically, most of these males that are infertile, the reason they have low testosterone is because they have something called secondary hypogonadism. In other words, they have low testosterone, uh, but in the context of functioning testicles, right? For some reason, testicles are not producing as much testosterone as they should be, and that's a combination of dietary factors and endocrine disruptors and stress, as I mentioned. The testicles are fine for now, 
But that's it's a big, big caution for now. If this continues, they may actually structurally start to deteriorate. But uh, so total testosterone test, uh, I would say testing for estradiol is probably not a bad idea. And this will allow to calculate the testosterone to the estrogen ratio. Uh, it needs to be at least 50 to 1, uh, 5, 0 to 1. So testosterone needs to be at least 50 times higher than your than than the than the uh, estradiol in on the blood test. Prolactin is a very good one. Uh, and in fact, back in the day, uh, um, the anti-prolactin drugs used to be uh, have been used and continue to be used off-label as treatment for both male and female infertility, which tells you that there is a common factor. And that common factor, prolactin being, is actually goes hand in hand with estrogen. If you have high prolactin, then your estrogen is elevated, even if it does not show up as elevated on blood tests. And a lot of people say, well, how come I have normal estrogen in my blood, uh, on my blood result and then my prolactin is high? That guarantees that the estrogen inside of the cells is actually higher than normal. You cannot have high prolactin without having an elevated intracellular estrogen. Um, and it, conversely, the, the anti-prolactin drugs are very good fertility drugs for both males and females. Um, cholesterol levels, um, basically, uh, if they're above the 200 mark, chances are that the male is hypometabolic. And the amount of testosterone you produce is directly controlled by your metabolic rate. It's not a coincidence that males with aging start to get puffy and chubby and, and they get the beer gut, the infamous beer gut and whatnot. Uh, this coincides per and the low testosterone levels. This coincides perfectly with a decline in the metabolic rate of the male. Same with the female, but they, they, they deposit the fat differently. They use it usually around the thighs and around the breast area. Um, but it's still, it's just a symptom of declining metabolic rate, which can be measured by the amount of cholesterol in your blood. If cholesterol rises, chances are that basically your metabolic rate is declining. And since cholesterol is the precursor to testosterone and all other steroids, but you know t testosterone being the important one for males, then you're not going to be producing as much testosterone as you really need. Um, what else? I mean, I think carbon dioxide is also a good measure uh, for metabolic rate. Vitamin D is a very good one. Um, even though vitamin, most people think of vitamin D as a bone kind of uh, uh, vitamin slash hormone. It is actually very, very important for fertility. And multiple studies, intervention studies have demonstrated that giving males between five to 8,000 units of vitamin D daily can uh, eliminate about 30 to 40% of the infertility in that specific group. So you can slash that, that infertility by half just by giving people vitamin D. What does vitamin D have to do with, uh, with fertility? Well, it, it looks like the vitamin D, because of its structure, is actually a steroid. Uh, uh, or partially broken steroid, the Latin name is sicosteroid, uh, is capable of activating some of the same um, enzymes and pathways that testosterone does. So you can think of vitamin D as acting as a uh, testosterone mim mimetic into the male body and as a progesterone in the female body. But it also stimulates the synthesis of more testosterone. Um, and since vitamin D levels are basically one of the best indicators of both sun exposure and metabolic rate, low vitamin D levels are yet another indicator of how well the metabolic rate is, is functioning in that male. Ultimately, all health problems stem from low metabolic rate, and all of these endocrine disruptors are basically shutting down this male's metabolic rate. And one of the first things that a body does when metabolism is not going well is sacrifice, quote-unquote, the, the, the uh, um, uh, physiological functions that are considered lu luxurious, which reproduction is one of them. Uh, basically, the body says, well, my, my job now is to keep you alive so you can forget about having babies. Um, and it's it's not also not a coincidence that when a male is stressed, sick, etc., and has low testosterone levels, there is less sexual desire. This is nothing abnormal about that, and the body is basically saying, <laughs> you can't even get this woman pregnant. Forget about taking care of this kid. So I'm going to, you know, keep you uh, depressed and you know and slow you down until your health improves. This is a natural physiological response to a suboptimal environment. And we're seeing it, again, uh, emphasize, we're seeing it mostly in the urbanized environment. There's something about urban living over the last, you know, 50 years that has happened because it wasn't the case before. Uh, that has basically resulted in very bad, uh, you know, foot conditions for the male fertility. By the way, I know this episode is about the male fertility, but if you look at the statistics, the infertility causes, you know, infertile couple are about 50-50 male-female. So female fertility is decimated as well. Um, and there's something in the urban living that seems to be causing that. And I think I mean, based on what I've seen from the studies is, again, a combination of stress, endocrine disruptors, and poor diet, which contains itself a lot of endocrine disruptors as well. So when you say endocrine disruptors, what would be the main sources there for people to look out for? 
Uh, mostly plastics, uh, some, even some benign things such as uh, toilet paper, paper towels, uh, receipts from the store have the highest amount per square inch of endocrine disruptors, higher than even plastic. Uh, and our people is like, why? Well, because the paper that is the, the, that is being produced, they're trying to make a paper that's more resilient to degradation from water and, you know, just they're uh, generally tearing it up, right? So so they, apparently there is a, a decent amount of plastic or some kind of a, other kind of a plastic derivative. And the bisphenols, which are basically the, these components, these chemical structures that contain two phenol rings, and estrogen is a very similar component, it contains a phenol ring. So... These, these things are ubiquitous in nature, and they're very, very, they're usually uh, highly present in plants. Uh, one reason, uh, probably, why uh, most people should be careful about eating raw vegetables, uh, mostly vegetables are present, because these things were designed to actually deter most organisms from eating the plants. Plant doesn't want to get eaten. Plant wants to grow up and make babies and may spread those babies, right? So they they want to get they, they want to deter pesky, um, you know, uh, aliens like us from eating them, and they do with these with these endocrine disruptors, which mess with your digestion, mess your eat with your endocrine system, uh, and there should be a signal to a healthy, intuitive animal that one well, I don't want to eat that. Only the herbivores have the necessary machinery to actually kind of overcome that. And happens to do with the tricamera stomach and the bacteria that's there, uh, but we're not. So the way we, if we eat vegetables at all, they should be very, very well cooked. Um, and but it, this destroys most of the naturally occurring endocrine disruptors, which are based on these phenol molecules. Resveratrol is a very common one, and that can be destroyed by cooking. But the synthetic ones that are coming from plastics, they're usually very resistant to heat. Um, and unfortunately, the, uh, the only way to degrade them, uh, the only study that I've seen about degrading them, is by increasing the metabolic rate. There's something about increasing the, meta the metabolic rate in both males and females that allows the organism to conjugate these molecules that are stored mostly in the fat tissue and excrete them. And the, the more you excrete them, basically, the, the, you know, the more, the more your natural health will, will get restored. So basically, these endocrine disruptors, they're kind mm -hmm. of acting to ultimately raise the estrogen levels both inside the blood and also stored in the tissues of these males. Yeah, much, much more nefarious than that. They actually they're acting as thyroid antagonists. So they actually work in a way directly opposite to the thyroid hormone. So they're directly lowering a metabolic rate. They're also acting as estrogen receptor agonists. So they're perfectly mimicking the effects of estrogen, even if you didn't have estrogen. Um, and it's like you're getting an estrogen in the pill. But it is much more potent, and that's why uh, some of the doctors that I've talked to are saying, "Oh no! If, if females were hyperestrogenic, hyper would have seen this on blood tests." But most of them actually have, you know, sometimes even have low estrogen levels. So I say, "Yeah, that's what happens when you ingest an, a synthetic estrogen from the outside, because your body says, oh my God, I have a lot of estrogen because this thing works like estrogen.' So the response is to scale down your own estrogen production, and on blood tests." sometimes you'll show up with low estrogen, right? And that's why I said originally for males, you can you can have low estrogen in blood and still be very, very hyperestrogenic. And the way you check it is by prolactin. If there is something in the body that acts like estrogen, prolactin will rise. So if prolactin is high, you are hyperestrogenic, period. And the secondary test, the, est the estrogen levels in the blood is less reliable. You shouldn't really rely on it. You should rely on the prolactin. When you ingest these endocrine disruptors, prolactin rises in both males and females, and it's an anti-fertility factor in both sexes. What's some other estrogenic sources for males, like deodorant? Oh, uh, by the way, the, the endocrine disruptors are also anti-androgenic, which is another gain for males, because the activation of the androgen receptor is necessary for uh, developing a lot of the uh, you know, secondary uh, sexual male characteristics that make us attractive to heterosexual females. They're not going to grow facial hair, which is now ubiquitous. I mean, there's an entire multi-billion dollar industry coming up with these ridiculous toxic sprays to make males grow facial hair because their testosterone levels are low and they're seeing, okay, m you know, women don't like <laughs> without hair, so what am I supposed to do? Well, the reason is you have an endocrine problem. You don't change it, you don't fix it by applying a spray. Maybe it'll work temporarily, but the way it works, most of these, if you look at most of these sprays, they contain some kind of a synthetic androgen. Um, so another corroboration to the fact that the males are getting basically, um, whatever is happening in this environment, it acts very in an anti-male fashion. And by the way, anti-female as well. Um, it's because estrogen, even though it's kind of necessary for sexual function and ovulation in females, if you give it too much, uh, uh, females become masculinized, and I think that's another thing we've been seeing um, in the urban populations. Very, very feminized men and very, very masculinized women. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I saw a study that showed that polyester garments or underwear actually completely obliterated male fertility. Bagel? So that's just another source right on an important area of your body. Yep. So plastic clothing. Plastic, plastic clothing, bottles. carpets, carpets like the, the, they're full of these flame retardants, which almost oh, yeah. universally are carcinogenic and estrogenic. Carcinogenism and estrogenism go hand in hand. Not many people know, but in 2001, I'll send you the link. NIH, again, the official government, declared estrogen a known human carcinogen. In, in this situation, I don't have any idea how any doctor can push with good conscience, maybe because they don't know or, or they don't care. Oh, to females, here is the spill taken, you know, for, you know, for as birth control. So, uh, to, by the way, that uh, females taking birth control pills, a lot of which contain estrogen, rubs off on the male. Like, uh, you know, when, and when they're having sex and there is a contact down there. Uh, basically, if the female is, is hyperestrogenic, uh, she's leaking these synthetic estrogens that she's been taken by the pill, or, or the synthetic progest progestins, many of which are also estrogenic, but they're definitely anti-androgenic as well, that affects the male as well. Not to mention the attraction part. Um, have you seen the studies that when females basically uh, get on the pill, they like a specific type of male, and then they get together and they stop the pill because they want to have babies, and suddenly the female finds the male no longer attractive and they break up or they get into physical fights. There's like plenty of studies on that. Basically, Now, basically, the, you, the, the, the gynecologists are kind of trying to advise women uh, Find a male without being on the pill, right? And then get on the pill. If you're on the pill and he finds a partner, there's a good chance that if you get off the pill, th there's going to be a clash there, or at least you're not going to find that partner as attractive as before. Yeah, but, but don't get on the we, pill. We did, a, <laughs> yes. we, we did a poll on our Instagram story about that specific study to see if anybody who was following us had that experience. And I would say it was over 50% of the people who had found a partner when they were on birth control actually for either for a long period of time was not sexually attracted to this person yep. or they ended up having to end the relationship because yeah. the state that they were in when they were off the pill was so different than what when they were on it. Every single steroid is known to have a neurosteroid action. Um, if you type neurosteroids in Google, you will you get the Wikipedia page. and it, Every single one listed there is also a sex hormone. Uh, so so w what your hormones are, what you take, and what you're exposed to the environment, and the way you change your endocrine profile determines almost completely your sexual preference and the specific type of person you'll be attracted to from the opposite sex or, or the same sex if you actually have gotten that exposed to endocrine disruptors. Another one in the environment would be exposure to mold. Yes. Um, I've read a lot that it actually mimics estrogen in your body as well. Yes. So that's going to be stored into your tissues. And overall, when we're talking about all these different endocrine disruptors, they're hindering the metabolic rate. And I think that any exposure to something that's toxic like that is going to push you further and further into a hypometabolic state, which is almost like this negative domino effect. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you start peeling back these layers and reduce your exposure and increase your metabolism and maybe do a few additional detoxification remedies, that is likely going to be enough to move you in the right direction. Yep. Yeah, step. It seems like step one is reducing your exposure because Georgia, you mentioned that a higher metabolic rate leads to improved detoxification of these yes. things. But yes. I feel like for many people, we are exposed to such high levels that the high toxic exposure to estrogen and estrogenic chemicals is actually one of the things that's holding back our metabolic rate. So it's like this, neg like you yeah. said. It's, it's like a test for it too. Effect. You have to get out of yeah. stress to get out of stress, right? Yeah. <laughs> Remember what I told you? Finding somebody who you live with and run away in the forest for a month. I, I stand by that statement. You want to you wanna get detoxed? You know, go away to like a completely wild wilderness area, preferably with somebody you're like and you're attracted to. Sit there, you know, do your happy thing for a month, and you probably you're not gonna want to come back. Or if you come back, mm -hmm. you'll be just like these people who went off the birth birth control and be like, I don't want this environment. There's something inherently toxic about it. No, that's a very valid suggestion. Uh, Ashley and I are very deep into like the mold toxicity thing, and so mm -hmm. that is a common thing for people to have to do is they are suggested to move away from their environment for a period of time to see if they actually just start getting better on their own. And it's likely because um, we're moving somewhere cleaner, maybe more sun, more yep. fresh air. And that is a very big change in the right direction for somebody to go through. Yeah, there is a, a lot of yeast. Like, let's say you go to a particular part of like the country where there's a lot of food is produced with specific kind of yeast. Some people are so sensitive to eat because uh, it plays a big role into the growth of molds, yeast, and generally uh, other kinds of like fungi. Um, so you know, a, a lot of the commercial food uh, contains a specific kind of yeast, but the type of yeast depends on the area of the country where you are. 
Um, and I, I know people who basically can eat a specific kind of bread in one part of the country. The exact same kind of bread bought in another part of the country just doesn't sit well with them. Um, so, yeah, so changing the environment for a month. And I think Dr. Pete mentioned that to some people who said that, what can I, I've tried everything and nothing works. And like he said, well, maybe your cocoon, the way where you are right now, the combination of things is like too much of a, like a, a you know, toxic combination to kind of try to tease apart. Why don't you get out of town for, for you know, for a few weeks? Uh, and usually things improve uh, to the point where when you, when you go back, you kind of intuitively sense that I have to go back, but I know it's not good for me. Um, and if that happens, then I think it's a good indication for whoever can afford it to change something drastically. You know, um, you know, work location, you know, living location, type of diet, potentially even partner, because, you know, they, they can contribute a lot to your toxic lifestyle. Yeah. So I think it's important to consider that you know, unlike mainstream medicine, which views every body part as a silo, you know, mm -hmm. so I'm sure someone in mainstream medicine is going to say like, oh, there's just something wrong with your genitals. Like that's the yeah. reason why, but under the bioenergetic view, the body works as a system. And so the internal state of your body impacts the hormone production and the hormone production impacts how the body runs as a system. Yep. So in your recommendation for someone who is just really in the wrong direction. So they are just extremely estrogen dominant, extremely stressed out, low fertility. Are there any beneficial supplements that you would recommend in addition yeah. to obviously reducing your plastic exposure, cleaning up your diet, but are there any supplements that can help you get kickstarted in the right direction? Yeah. Um, but the caveat that if, if fertility improves and this person now manages to have a child, uh, keep in mind that unless your health improves as well, you're not going to be a very good parent. I mean, this the, things can deteriorate just as just as quick as they got better. So fixing the fertility, you should view fertility or low fertility in this case as a sign that something is really not well functioning in your life, which is driving down the metabolic rate. And in your case, or at least for now, the the fertility is just a just the first symptom of these things going wrong. Right down the road could be something else. You can get a heart attack, God forbid, or like a, a digestion problem, or you know. Uh, some other endocrine problem um so so things need to change but with that in mind i mean some very simple things i've seen people who are completely uh, and there was a male fertility infertility in this case uh basically the doctor said oh your testosterone level is 350 by the way the lower limit of almost 300 and and it, to put this in, into perspective back to the studies in the 1970s 800 which is now the upper limit of normal was actually the average so the doctor said no nothing's wrong with you you're actually in range um so we're gonna you know pump your wife full of uh, clomiphene um we're gonna do artificial try to do like a artificial intrauterine insemination i think they call it so they you know get the sperm from the male try to eliminate all the dead sperm right and remain only the viable ones and then inject them into the woman and try to get her pregnant N none of that worked five tries uh and then i said well why don't you try some aspirin um, and a little bit of vitamin E. Um, and he did. And he, by the way, I asked him to retest. And his testosterone went up to, to the 500 limit. By the way, I'm not mentioning this by chance. I'll explain in a minute why. And then they got pregnant. Uh, but he, this person realized that something is definitely not going well with their life. So if, after the baby was born, they picked up and they went back and or they were close, uh, living closer to the grandparents on both sides. Um, and now with less stress, with a new baby, grandparents are helping out. They're happy. Everybody's happy. Less stress. So basically, the the, the, the testosterone levels of the male were in the 500 when the woman got pregnant, and now in the they're in the 700. Um, and the reason I say 500 is that I'll send you the study, but basically sh sh show that no, so no male with a total testosterone level below 500 in the study that was tested was able to naturally create a baby. No male. And 500, in, basically, if you go to the doctor and you score the 500, the doctor will probably shake your hand and will say, my man, you're good. You can impregnate a brick. Um, but uh, if you look at the actual averages across the United States, 500 is actually, uh, you know, the doctor will be right because those are the averages within the United States. But if you look at, if you break it down by state, and if you look at basically where the most fertile men are, they are in the mountains in the Midwest uh, and a little bit to the south. Nothing on that side on, on both, uh, like uh, on both coasts. You know, they're over there, they're in the 300s. Uh, so 500, I'll send you a study, no male, and it was like 300 or some different males randomly selected, so it is statistically significant. Uh, no male with a total testosterone under 500 was able to become naturally a father, even with the stimulation of the female. Uh, so yeah, aspirin, vitamin E, uh, another factor uh, also known to help uh, males, and that was 
tested extensively in the early 20th century as part of the vitamin E test is something called the polycotinols. Uh, and I think we discussed this in regards to feeding them to chickens because it increases the, the egg yield of the chicken. But if you look at those studies, it also made, made the chickens, both male and female, more fertile. Uh, the chickens produce more eggs and the male roosters produce more sperm. So basically, it was a fertility factor, and that was tested back in the early 20th century, and they attributed most of the fertility to the vitamin E, because what they tested in the early 20th century was wheat germ oil. But it turns out that it wasn't the wheat germ oil, it was the fraction of the wheat germ oil containing vitamin E and the polycosinos, key portion, because after vitamin E was isolated, they redid some of these studies, and although vitamin E was very helpful, it did not fully replicate the increase in fertility uh, produced by wheat germ oil. But when they added the polycosinol, so the combination of vitamin E and polycosinol basically acted almost like a very potent either anti-estrogen or an androgen like testosterone. And, and in, uh, you know, uh, invariably, when they fed the male animals the vitamin E and or the polycosinol, their total testosterone levels rose. Uh, what else? I mean, um, uh, if people are willing to, or vitamin D, as I mentioned, right, uh, or often something as low as 5,000 units, even though that's not considered low by general standards, it is actually kind of low. A recent study came out saying that the RDAs that the FDA came up with are probably underestimated by a factor of at least 10. So if the RDA published by the FDA says that you should get 400 units of vitamin D daily, what it really means is you should get at least 4,000 which kind of corroborates that study, which showed that if you give males 5,000 units of vitamin D, D daily, another one did 8,000, uh, basically their testosterone levels almost double, uh, and fertility uh, in, in the males improves. Um, and then uh, these are probably the most benign things that, that, that can people find in, in most stores. Uh, things like um, uh, uh, gelatin are also very strong pro fertility effect, probably mostly due to its anti inflammatory effect. A lot of these assaults that are seeing around us, ultimately, the, you know, the way they, 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 they uh, cause the uh, downing of the metabolic rate other than endocrine factors, that they're all pro inflammatory. Like if you get a mold, it's pro inflammatory. Endotoxin is pro inflammatory. The polyunsaturated fats are pro inflammatory. Um, anything you get in, inside of your system that the body does not like, it will cause an immune reaction, and the part of the immune reaction is triggering the inflammatory response. Chronic low-grade inflammation is known to actually be a reliable uh, infertility causal factor, um, and it was actually, uh, there was a proposal, I think back in the 1980s, to create a male infertility injection, which consisted of nothing but the prostaglandins. And the prostaglandins are these highly pro-inflammatory molecules, which aspirin inhibits, by the way, probably why it helps to one reason why it helps with male fertility, and they're derived from the polyunsaturated fats. So something as benign as chronic low-grade inflammation can make the male fully infertile, even in the probably in the presence of normal testosterone levels. By the way, but those usually decline when there's a chronic inflammation present. So anti-inflammatory drugs are likely to help. Have been shown to help, not just aspirin, but aspirin is probably the most benign of them. Ibuprofen is actually known to have anabolic effects, not just uh, pro fertility, even in males as old as in their 90s. Um, and it turns out that inflammation is a very big factor in frailty and infertility in males. So they give these males an anti-inflammatory drug, their inflammation declined, their testosterone levels, you know, increase, and they started chasing the grandmas again. Mm, okay, so when it comes to actually binding with things in the body to help get rid of mm -hmm. them, so for in the process of removing these things, these toxins from our body, where do you see binders? Like I know Dr. AP typically would just recommend activated charcoal. Yes. So where do you see that coming in? Uh, the charcoal will mostly help by preventing their absorption from the food if they're present in the food into the bloodstream. After they're already in, into your body, basically several studies looked at what can actually chelate these things. Um, and it looks like the reactive oxygen species that we produce as part of our normal metabolic rate um, can actually destroy uh, or at least deactivate these endocrine disruptors. So just that's just making the metabolic rate higher will actually create and would destroy many of these endocrine disruptors while they're still in the tissues. And the rest can actually be more effectively excreted by the liver because as, as the tissue turnover increases, uh, the old cells that die and rupture, they spill their kind of entrails into the bloodstream. And then these things will circulate and a lot of them will end up in the liver. And then with a good metabolic rate, a well-functioning liver will be able to attach something called glucuronic acid or sulfate group to these lipid soluble endocrine disruptors which a lot of them are especially the plastic derived ones and then you excrete them more easily through the urine so i think what we've discussed so far is kind of the one side of the, the equation which is kind of reducing toxin exposure reducing inflammation mm -hmm. and then on the flip side in parallel we should be working on improving our metabolic rate yes um and so 
I think there's some people in the health and wellness space that say that males and females are different because mm -hmm. females work on a monthly cycle, males are on a 24 hour cycle. And so males are a little bit more resilient to some lifestyle behaviors like fasting and keto and low carb um, and ice baths and these type of things. Um, can you touch briefly touch on how like lifestyle behaviors, how that's playing into cortisol versus improving or lowering the metabolic rate? I don't think it's true that males are more resilient. It entirely depends on the endocrine balance. Uh, was, uh, the last podcast with Dr. Soledino, we actually spoke about this and specifically in regards to fasting. He said, what do you think about fasting? I said, uh, you need to do the, uh, the blood check for several st uh, hormones, specifically cortisol and DHEA. Um, and several studies have already shown that the cortisol to DHE ratio is the best predictor of all-cause mortality and future morbidity. In other words, no matter what disease you're going to get into the future or what you die from, can be almost entirely predicted by the cortisol to DHEA ratio. And you want that to be as low as possible. In other words, cortisol should not run unopposed. DHEA is the is the is one of the protective factors. So the reason I'm saying males are not more resilient is that if you get a male with a suboptimal cortisol to DHEA ratio, they will not be resilient to even like a three hour fast. They start shaking, uh, they start getting jittery, even aggressive to the point of, you know, violent aggression as well. Um, so really the whole resilience thing is, comes down to your endocrine balance and your metabolic rate. Um, I know women who basically, you know, do hard physical work all day because they work on a farm. Um, I mean, they can probably arm wrestle 99% of the males that are around me here in the city and, uh, <laughs> and not, give them, not just give them a good run for the money, but basically win 9, 10 out of, 9 out of 10 times. Uh, you'll be, you'll be, I don't know, if you come to the city, DC specifically, you'll be appalled at the males that are walking around here. Did you see that article from uh, about the, the testosterone levels of the buzz, the journalists that worked in BuzzFeed? So it's it's been like a popular talk. Uh, you can Google it. It's been a popular talking point uh, uh, among conservatives that uh, the soy boys that live in the cities, uh, they're really not males at all. Uh, but it, it used to be an anecdote up until recently, and then the the buzz the three or four males from BuzzFeed said, "Well, let's let's actually check because we feel like alpha males." So then when they checked their testosterone levels, I think three of the five or the four were actually hypogonadal. The testosterone levels were actually below uh, the, the the lower limit of normal. One guy was in the 300s. So soy boys down to the last one. Uh, and and, and uh, if you look at the comments behind the, the under the article, like, yeah, you can tell by looking at them. Not a single one of them has facial hair. Not a single one of them has any muscle, any sign of muscle on their body. Uh, some of them, you know, basically, uh, you know, they, um, what's it called? Oh, only one of them has ever been in the gym and lifted weights. Nobody even knows what a farm looks like. Anyways, long story short, the, uh, you know, the, yeah. Sounds like Bill Gates. <laughs> yes, sounds like Bill Gates. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, and it's not surprising that people like Bill Gates push the kind of things that we're seeing lately, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the low testosterone in males can get them uh, to do some crazy things. Much crazier than, you know, there's a stereotype of the crazy old woman. Men can be crazier, um, you know, if their testosterone levels drop sufficiently. In fact, males produce more testosterone in their later years than a woman does. Um, it's not a coincidence that if you look at very, very old like couples, the males look very, very feminized, and the women kind of look masculinized or at least uh, ambiguous, right? That's not a coincidence. After andropause, and it's not just menopause that exists, but andropause as well. After the male testosterone levels decline below the 500 mark, and the the estrogen levels are always rising with age because it, it always rises with inflammation, aging, low metabolic rate, etc. Once that that crucial ratio of testosterone to estrogen drops below the 50 mark, you're basically getting a, you know, uh, endocrinologically, you're getting a woman, uh, or at least a very, a very feminized male, if you can even consider that. Hmm. Wow. So basically, these kind of uh, fasting, keto, mm -hmm. it kind of depends on your stress bucket. And Absolutely. Your on your, resi on your uh, sort of like uh, the reserves that you have, and the adrenal reserves and the thyroid reserves. If you're a young, healthy, high testosterone male, you can probably weather, you know, like a week, like a week long fast. But if you're an older person, especially with some extra weight, these fasts are not gonna do you, do you any good. Look at that study that um, on the, the the show, The Biggest Loser. <laughs> what an aptly named show. So these people lost a lot. A lot of them, you know, the one, the ones that won, they lost all of their weight through like a grueling program of exercise and fasting and whatnot. And then, and then basically after they were done, some of them ended up in the hospital because they were, it was so stressful. Some of them became diabetic out of the fasting. 
that's you know definitely should be a wake-up call for many people but every single one that came out of the hospital most of them were males re not only regained their weight but they overshoot it by about 25 to 30 percent so they really shot themselves in the foot they decimated their metabolic rate and their testosterone levels were even lower than when they started and those people do not weather fasting well i mean like i said uh, many of them ended up in the hospital and uh, I don't, I mean, in general, you don't hear of somebody doing a fast that ended up in a hospital, right? So, so you can really, it really depends on how resilient you are. Uh, I don't know people over the age of 50 who can, who can handle well a fast longer than 24 hours. It just doesn't sit well with them and they, you know, feel like they're going to pass out or they get really like jittery uh, and agitated and angry. Um, so it's not something to be, it's not something to be trifled with. Everything is fun and ga like one of my friends says, like everything is fun and games until you're 60 and none of your children talks to you and you cannot walk anymore or get out of the door because of chronic arthritis. So <laughs> don't, don't play tricks. Don't, don't play stupid games with your body because you'll pay the price later. Yeah. So what would you say is the main reason that this population cannot tolerate doing, let's for, say, example, longer than a 24-hour fast? Is it the elevated cortisol? Uh, probably most likely the cortisol and the endocrine disruptors because if you raise estrogen, estrogen actually produce, uh, increases the production of cortisol even in the absence of stress. Um, one of the reasons why a lot of um, uh, women that are used to be on pure estrogenic birth control, but you know the the the, the, the classic stereotypical the, the the hysterical woman in the office and everybody saying, oh, is it is it that time of the month yet? Except it's happening every day. Well, what could be what could be causing that? And it's estrogen because it's an neuroexcitotoxin. That's that's well known, and also increases the production of cortisol. It can and that that cortisol cannot be turned off until the estrogen levels decline. Uh, typically, estrogen uh, cortisol has a pulsile uh, rhythm. It's higher in the morning and it's lower in the afternoon. It starts rising again in the evening. Uh, it's been shown that women who are on the on the on the pill, especially if it contains estrogen, they have a flat rhythm, and the flat the flat rhythm is always higher than what the optimal real is. It's about two times higher. So when you when the cortisol is chronically elevated, you cannot relax. And, and you know, just people with high cortisol, they're always hyper, they're always wired, and it, it raises sufficiently high, they become manic. Um, so I would say chronic stress combined with the fact that most people do this and subconsciously they feel like they have no way out. So the learned helplessness kicks in as well. Uh, and it's the, the, the depression, most of the, the depression cases really are hypercortisolemia. Uh, there's a drug which is was marketed as a, an abortion pill, which it is, and now it's in the news for different reasons for the abortion, but it was designed as the cortisol blocker. It's, the name is RU486, also known as Mifepristone. So they basically uh, gave, um, you know, the, uh, uh, they, they gave uh, women with clinical depression that was not treatable by anything else. They gave these women Mifepristone, and I think there were some males in the study as well, a rapid relief of depression within 24 hours. So it kind of shows you that for a large majority probably of the cases, depression is nothing but a symptom of chronic inescapable stress. Wow. So when you think about estrogen dominance, um, mm -hmm. is there any correlation <clears throat> between being overweight yeah. and this situation? Yes, absolutely. The more fat cells you have, because they, they have the highest concentration of the enzyme called aromatase. So the more fat you have, with more fat cells you have, the more estrogen you will be producing. Uh, now, this is bad in itself, but if you're also under chronic stress, then a lot of that fat will spill into the bloodstream, and since it, most of it is PUFA, the PUFA can also activate the stress response, uh, while saturated fat blocks it, I mean, or at least can turn it off. The PUFA can stimulate the aromatase enzyme even more, so it produces more estrogen. The PUFA can actually stimulate the cortisol production, even in the absence of the pituitary sending a stress signal. Um, so it's really, so it's the fat, it gets you about 50% to the place where you really screwed up. The other 50 is chronic stress because you can never relax. And as long as your bloodstream is flooded with fats, most of which are very bad for your health, uh, fertility specifically, but also in general, you know, for your health, then you, you really cannot get out of this. You, you, the stress has to stop in order for the lipolysis, which is the supply of fat from the tissues to the bloodstream, goes back to baseline. If that does not happen, your health will not improve, no matter what you do. Elevated lipolysis is now known to be even the driver of the final stages of cancer, the cachexia, which is the wasting, which is what we know people with advanced cancer to have, and it's what kills about 90% of the cancer patients. The other 10% are being killed by the drugs themselves, but 90% of the patients are being killed by the wasting uh, response, which is the cachexia, and that is now known to be triggered by excessive lipolysis. In other words, chronic stress, oversupply of fat, and the cells can never relax in the situation. They can never recover their metabolic rate. Okay, then, Georgie, now we're at this weird position where a lot of people 
are overweight, mm -hmm. have excess estrogen, mm -hmm. and they do need to lose weight to improve metabolic rate, but yep. the act of losing weight will increase lipolysis. Not so necessarily. You, you can raise your metabolic rate without actually doing the lipolysis by taking pro-metabolic substances. Aspirin is one of them. It actually, in higher doses, aspirin works identically uh, to the old weight loss drug, which is still very effective, unfortunately banned by the FDA, called dinitrophenol. And if you look at the early, uh, you know, kind of like a weight loss crazes that were really came from Hollywood in the 1940s and the 1950s, almost nobody at that time dieted. They all took drugs. Uh, and to this day, elite athletes almost never diet because they know it messes up with their metabolic rate. So they take drugs or they take some kind of a chemical substance that will help them lose weight. So dinitrophenol raises your metabolic rate. It is your heat production. And basically, most of the calories that you consume are, you know, kind of like, a, you know, wasted, wasted away as heat. You don't store them. Aspirin does the same thing, but you have to take significantly high doses. Uh, but even without that, in the lower doses, it acts as an aromatase inhibitor. So it's going to you know, prevent and stop some of the stress reaction that's causing this fat to go into your from, your from your tissues to your bloodstream and poison all of your tissues and create this chronic stress response, which is on top of the stress from the outside, right? Uh, aspirin also inhibits the enzyme, or, or at least the metabolite of aspirin, salicylic acid, inhibits the enzyme that synthesizes cortisol. So just in one pill, you have basically something that uh, reduces the excess, not too much, but there. This is the excess of estrogen and the excess of cortisol, which are known to be behind obesity. A uh, recent study, uh, I'll, show, I'll send you, which uh, demonstrated that an anti-estrogen drug was fully reversed the weight gain that happened that occurred in females uh, after menopause. So now we know that estrogen is actually causing the fat, the fattening of the women, even though the official version is no, women get fat after menopause because they have deficiency of estrogen. The exact opposite, actually. They have an excess of estrogen, but it's stored in the tissues. Vitamin E, estrogen antagonist. Vitamin E inhibits the synthesis of these uh, uh, um, uh, uh, pro-inflammatory mediators, the prostaglandins, which are infertility factors for males, and also pro-obesity for both males and females, and activate the enzyme aromatase. Vitamin E is itself an aromatase inhibitor and also acts as an antagonist directly at the estrogen receptor. Um, and then, you know, if people are willing to exp experiment with steroids, the ones that are over the counter, such as pregnenolone, progesterone, and DHEA, all three of them have anti cortisol and anti estrogenic effects. Gotta be careful with DHEA because you can convert to estrogen if you take too much. But in that study where I sh that showed that blocking estrogen reversed the obesity of menopause, uh, it, they also demonstrated that giving DHEA. Um, to to the to these animals also reverse the weight gain. So th these are pro youthfulness hormones, and you produce a lot of them when you're young, but the production declines when actually uh, uh, with with aging, and that's probably one of the reasons we're getting weight and we're becoming infertile with age with decline of the production of these uh, youthful hormones. So I think just to like summarize that discussion, we need to make sure that we're doing weight loss in a way that's improving the internal environment of our body and improving the metabolic rate or yes. we could get results such as the biggest loser because yeah. those extreme efforts done by those overweight people in the biggest loser that came at the cost of a reduction in their metabolic rate, which backfired in the end. So we want to make sure that we're supporting our metabolic rate, which can be measured by our body temperature and pulse exactly. throughout the day, supporting that as we are on our health and weight loss journey. And doing as much of, let's say, concentric exercise, because that's what builds muscle. The reason these people in The Biggest Loser ended up where they are is because they indiscriminately fasted and did, they did exhaustive exercise, which basically ended up losing most of the lean tissue. They also lost some fat, right? But they ended up in a situation that a medicine calls sarcopenic obesity. So they lost, sarcopenia means loss of muscle mass, and obesity, which means, of course, you know, they you still have the fat. So they ended up skinny fat, right? So they lost a lot of weight, but they lost the wrong, most of the wrong kind of weight, which is the lean muscle mass, which is what determines your basal metabolic rate. Thyroid and lean muscle mass control metabolic rate. The best way to build lean muscle mass is concentric exercise, which means contraction of the muscle with a load. But when it relaxes, it should be without a load. In other words, if you're doing bicep curls, you curl with a weight, but then you drop the weight. I know it sounds dangerous, but for a lot of guys, it is. But dead weight, you can, dead lift, you can probably lift it and then drop it. I know a lot of people do that, right? Uh, climbing stairs, uh, pushing heavy things around the farm. <laughs> like, uh, I don't know, like, uh, I don't know, you load something on a cart and you have to move it half a mile. That's actually probably one of the best exercises you can do because it activates almost every single muscle group, but it's almost purely concentric. 
Yeah, I think when well, that's interesting. So we're big proponents of obviously lifting weights, um, so <laughs> increasing your muscle mass, and I feel like that might help in general with just improved body composition, maybe reduction of fat. Yep. Um, you mentioned something about the um, estrogen receptors. So yeah. I understand like when you lose weight, you might reduce the amount you have. Is is that true? Both the amount of estrogen you produce and the amount of estrogen receptors, which is what estrogen activates to achieve its effects. So, so you really, you know, you kill two birds with one stone. And also, when you are doing concentric exercises, the muscles themselves become factories for producing testosterone in males and progesterone in DHA in women. Those are the protective steroids. Uh, so whenever you, 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 you strain your muscles with a load, they actually, in order to recover themselves, they produce the steroids that they need, and it melts less testosterone. But when you're doing eccentric exercise, that actually causes muscle breakdown and destroys the mitochondria. It does cause hypertrophy, right? So you're going to get maybe get bigger muscles, but they're not nearly as strong. And I'm sure you've seen this, like uh, the bodybuilder phenotype. A guy looks really bulky, but there's something off about him, and it's the muscles are disproportionate to the rest of his body. And then, you know, when they actually do the actual strength test, the guy with the biggest muscles ended up being much weaker than somebody who looks like uh, Mike Tyson in his prime. The guy didn't look very muscular, but looked like, a, I don't know, like looked like a brick, you know? Uh, that's really the phenotype you're looking for, um, and that is achieved by doing concentric exercise. Boxing is one of them. You know, when you hit, you're basically, you're facing something, you're contracting your muscle to hit something, but then you relax. I'm not saying everybody should get into street fights now, but, you know, farm work, lifting weights, trying to do more of the concentric one, avoiding the polyunsaturated fats as much as possible, getting as much sunlight as possible, which activates not only the synthesis of vitamin D, but also the synthesis of testosterone in your skin. The skin is the largest steroidogenic organ, larger than the brain and larger than even the gonads. The skin produces more steroids than probably the other organs combined. Uh, and the skin works optimally by supplying sufficient cholesterol, which comes from mostly eating animal products, um, ex exposure to sun, right? And of course, of course, good circulation, which comes from, you know, decent amount of physical exercise. Uh, again, but not the exhaustive kind where you basically paint yourself to death by running 10 miles, but things like, you know, working on a farm, lifting heavy things uh, in an intense fashion for about 20 minutes, and then you do something else. Yeah, so I think a really easy takeaway from this is that Lowering inflammation can mm -hmm. lower estrogen activity in the body, and simple ways to do that would be to stop eating PUFAs yep. and to get more sunlight and yep. to lower cortisol however possible. Um, clean up your diet so you're not just consuming things that are increasing estrogen or endotoxin inside. Looking, looking at the ingredients that you're putting on your skin yeah. for deodorant. Yeah. If it has more than five, I, I would skip on that product. Yeah, and maybe reducing the amount of polyester that you're yeah. wearing and exposure yeah. to plastics in the uh, drinks and stuff that you're consuming. And understanding your current metabolic rate will help you better understand your current resilience and kind of what type of lifestyle activities that are supportive to your health at this point in time, which can change over time. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Chronic stress, inflammation, and in generally uh, environment that you feel is not pleasant is one of the biggest, is probably the primary sign for your body to decide that it's not a good idea for you to now to either create or raise children, uh, and until that changes, basically the hormonal environment will not be uh, will not be on your side. You know, the hormonal environment will be geared towards survival, and towards survival, men are not in a very good shape to create or take care of children. Yeah. So Ashley mentioned fasting really quickly, and I wonder if people are seeing benefits from fasting or eating a lower carb diet because overall they are reducing the inflammation, and the, maybe that's coming from endotoxin. endotoxin yeah, exactly. Side. Yeah. And so then they'll actually see less estrogen activity, yeah. but we probably should think about, you know, using that therapeutically maybe, but then coming out of that and finding ways to improve the metabolism as a more of a long-term solution. Yeah. The, so the, so the fasting, which uh, was, I think they started again in the seventies that showed the extension of the lifespan. Then they started saying, okay, so is it the calories or is it not the calories? And to this day, mass media is trying to make you believe because they all want us to die. They're trying to make you believe that you're the problem. You should eat less, right? And move more, eat less and move more. Right. But it turns out it's not the calories. The, Multiple studies have demonstrated specific factors in the diet. When you eliminate them or greatly reduce them, they produce the same, if not even higher, lifespan extension than starving yourself half to death. Uh, some of those factors are elimination of the polyunsaturated fats, elimination of the inflammatory amino acids such as methionine, cysteine, and tryptophan, 
right? Elimination of some some of the things that produce endotoxins, such as resistant starches, which unfortunately now are being pushed on every down on everybody, saying, "Well, that's the best thing you can do." But it's going, going to lower the amount of insulin you produce. Turns out it's not the insulin that's the problem. It's basically the reason you have high insulin is because you have high cortisol. The reason you have high cortisol is because you have high high or low chronic grade inflammation, right? And that stems mostly from poor diet, which is inflammatory, endotoxin, and or stress. Um, it really, I mean, it's really one cycle of things, and and for the people that are really feel like in a vicious cycle and they cannot escape, really the plan is should be to escape for a little bit, even for a week, and usually more often than not you'll see a great a great change, probably to the point where you're going to start seeing where your problems are coming from, and you know try to uh, you know we'll have to make some hard decisions on you know how to avoid these. I I think that like it all comes down to people are so used to living in a stressed out, chronic, inflamed state. And so they need to experience what like a baseline is. Mm -hmm. And then it'll be a little bit easier to kind of navigate forward. It's just, it honestly, we, we talk about these things, but it's really hard in practice mm -hmm. because our current environment is so crappy. Our food supply is so bad. And so we're not saying any of this is like easy. Yeah. Um, it's it's hard to navigate through this modern time. We just don't know any better because everything is now engineered almost completely surrounding us by suboptimal things, and we think that's reality. And for many people, it is, right? If you never leave the city, if you're the urban type, that is your world. But once you leave and you see that there's a better way and, you know, it revolves some diff doing some different things, then uh, a lot of people are basically... Look, almost everybody who comes back from a nice and long and restful vacation hates coming back do you think that's a coincidence i mean not everybody hates their job but even the ones that don't hate their job are like ah i wish this could last a little bit longer why because it's healthy for you you know it's not just having the it's not, it's not just having fun that's healthy for you but the change in in the scenery and probably the better food and a better landscape and a better environment and potentially even the better people you're around when you're on vacation, that resonates with people and they don't want to go back to the meat grinder. It's called meat grinder for a reason. It's routine, it's boring, and it's crusty. <laughs> I had the, I just had the exact opposite experience. So we really? lived on a farm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Went, I went to a farm conference down in Texas and I had to travel, you know, airplanes, Wi-Fi, yeah. EMFs, yeah. Yeah. like yeah. weird, crappy food. And I just was so excited to get back because my I just don't function in normal society. I need to get back to like our our farm here where we don't have Wi-Fi. We eat good and it's just a completely different environment. So I kind of had like the flip experience. That's how actually life used to be for most people until probably the late 70s. Your home is your castle or your home is your That comes from somewhere. Now, right, for most people, it turns out to be the other way around. Home is a prison. You need to get out of it in order to realize like how free you can be. But it used to be that home is where you basically, where you're your optimal self. We need to go back to that. Unless that happens, because home is where you spend most of the time, or at least the home environment is where most of the most most of your life revolves around. If that is not optimal, then you cannot expect hell to be uh, to be in a, in a good situation. Yeah, I think that topic is so deep too, because I think <clears throat> people fail to realize that they can actually be exposed to things like bacteria and endotoxin in high levels from their home, provided that it wasn't maintained properly or just you know maybe there's water damage somewhere. And so it really is a you have to take a very holistic approach to recognize what could be your potential problem. If you've done all the dietary changes and you are working on, you know, your exercise routine and lowering stress and you haven't yet tried Georgie's suggestion of maybe going away for a few weeks and see if you feel better, that might be something to seriously consider. Just considering that a lot of the people that listen to our podcast and that we interact with online are people who have dealt with chronic illness and have tried almost every single thing possible. They've tried every single restrictive diet. They've fasted. They've tried pro-metabolic and maybe they didn't get a super good response. And it might not be your diet. It might not be your exercise routine. It very well could be something else. So I really like that we kind of came to that at the end of this conversation to recognize that the environment that we're in is really not set up for us to succeed. And so you do have to be aware of these things. It is scary, but um, being aware is way better than being ignorant and just going forward without being able to take control of your own health. I agree. Yeah. Tr truth may be unpleasant, but it's always better than a pack of lies. Yep. Very true. All right. Well, any concluding Mark's remarks um, in terms of improving male fertility? I think uh, chronic avoidance of sunlight is very uh, detrimental and very common. Um, I posted a study on my blog maybe like two years ago that showed that avoidance of sunlight is actually worse than smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. 
So think about that. No, and actually they compared it. They looked at people who smoked, who, who people who didn't, people who did sunlight, who, people who didn't, and the ones basically the smokers did better, <laughs> and not by a marginal amount, did better if they spent time a little bit time outside than the non-smokers who are basically avoiding sunlight or applying the sunscreen all the time. Uh, the the whole thing, the scary stories about melanoma that medicine is trying to to tell you. If you actually push your doctor, they will readily admit that the melanomas are probably not sun related because they almost never appear. On a surface that is hit, that is being hit by the sun, it's always somewhere hidden. It's either like the bottom of your sole of the of the foot, somewhere hidden, like you know, around the pubic area, uh, the pelvic area, somewhere or, or like a, 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 on your armpit, or like behind a ear, or someplace or on the scalp, some places where basically the sun doesn't really shine much. So it's the the sun is not causing the melanomas. All the study, probably the only one that I, because uh, I try to dig a little bit, about, demonstrated that melanoma, just like all the other cancers, is also endocrinologically driven, and is driven by estrogen. So, un unfortunately, and perhaps ironically, most of the sunscreens that are being applied and sold to males and females contain estrogenic endocrine disruptors. And, uh, and ironically, if you look at the rates of melanoma, they have been steadily rising since the 1970s, again, this crucial decade, um, and, and that's when the sunscreen usage really, you know, kind of like took off. Um, sun exposure has never been lower per capita than it is now. Sunscreen usage has never been higher per capita than it is now. And melanoma rates have never been higher than, than they are than they're now per capita. So don't be afraid of the sun. Oh, another study showed that even if you get melanoma, if you spend more time in the sun, you're likely to survive it without any treatment. Then you actually continue to avoid the sun and do the regular treatments. Sun, uh, the UV light in sun does cause, you know, at least increase the risk of the more benign cancers, which are never lethal, and that's the basal cell and the squamous cell carcinomas, which worst case scenario can be easily cut off and almost never spread. So that's really the worst they can expect from an extremely high chronic exposure, which is what even people in the standing salons very rarely get. And by going to the sun, you're not getting just the UV light, you're getting the red light spectrum, which is very, very beneficial for male fertility specifically. And I'll tell you, I mean, some males can try if they want to, but several studies have shown and confirmed in males that basically exposing the testicles to pure red light for about three to four minutes a day drastically increased both the, the sperm um, uh, production and the testosterone levels. In fact, there's a clinical trial now, I think it's in Japan, or in one Southeast Asia country that has a very big problem with uh, with uh, fertility, they're basically, it's uh, it's been negative for a very long time now, um, the birth rate, I'm sorry, uh, is, and they've tied it to low male fertility, is now trying to approve this as a male treatment for infertility. Now, I'm not saying you should be a uh, uh, bathing your jewels in red light. I'm saying you can try it if you want, but it's better for you if you actually go and do whole body exposure to sunlight, maybe even get like bare chested, because that, because the, the, the cumulative effect of this uh, larger area, body area of exposure to sunlight, is probably going to be better for you than just, uh, you know, shining the red light down there. Um, and actually, it's going to increase testosterone production in your muscles, make you feel better. I don't know of a person who went out in the sun for like a half an hour and did something exciting and did not come back a better person. Uh, I do know quite a few people that live, spend their life mostly inside their computer geeks like me, uh, and they don't look very good. All of them are infertile. I mean, not many of them are married or partner, but the ones that are don't have kids. Um, and they, they don't have the desire either. And I keep saying, just go out, have some fun in the sun. It's almost like they're afraid of it. It's going to change their life so drastically that they'll feel like they'll have nothing in common with their previous life and they have to make some major changes. But I think that's better than just sitting there and slowly decaying. Oh, I totally agree. That's a huge component of this too, is finding more of a like-minded community when you're making these shifts. Because if you're surrounded by people who sit inside all day, they're on the computer all the time, or I mean, nothing wrong with computer. Like everybody works on the computer nowadays. It's just fact. But um, if you find people who are more willing to go explore these different, more like obscure routes of health, which really shouldn't be seen that way, then maybe you'll be more inclined to stick with it. So I think that's another good suggestion is to find people who have higher testosterone levels than yourself and hang out with them. Yeah, that's <laughs> it, it will raise your testosterone levels. Yes. <laughs> it's just, it's just an, an, an adaptation. There's a, I don't know if you've seen it, there's a study that uh, it was, it was about psychology, but then it was a endocrine study that confirmed it. You are the average of the 10 people closest to you in terms of personality. Um, so, but then they also looked at the hormone levels and turned out that the same is true. Your hormone levels are the average of the 10 women that are around you, right? That are closest to you, not just around you, right? That you spend time with. You do know that females synchronize their periods when they go under the same roof, right? Men do the same, but it happens with testosterone levels. Yeah. 
my cycle is slowly moving towards our roommates. <laughs> <laughs> Analyze the, the hormone levels of those at your table. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. And maybe when you run away, go somewhere sunny. Yeah. Oh, I think that, that maybe I would not. Well, the only the only reason I would run away to a, something not sunny if you're basically in a situation where you feel your life has hit a wall. There's nothing else that you could do. If you feel nothing else you could do that could improve it, then even if it's a you know rainy place like the you know the Pacific Northwest, it's probably going to be better because this is forest there. You can go out in nature, you know, spend some time alone or like yeah. with the person that you like, and uh, away from civilization. And really, most of the things that it can offer are not that good for us. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Georgie. Appreciate your insights. Thanks for inviting me. Always. And we'll, we will post the links to the studies that Georgie sent mm -hmm. us below, and we'll include a link to Georgie's blog where he posts these topics weekly. So make sure, isn't it heydut.me? H A I D U T dot me. Yeah. yeah. That's the personal blog. And um, yeah. Okay. Let's see how long the last Twitter is sending me some signs that they may block me, but uh, for the articles, not for my discussions there. But it's okay. The blog is still there. <laughs> You know you're doing a good thing when you get blocked. That's true. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, Georgie. So that was a great conversation with Georgie. This is just a re recap. So this is Ashley and Sarah now talking separately. Georgie is always fun to talk to. Yeah. He is just an encyclopedia of studies. <laughs> he really is. And I know that it's sometimes easy to get lost in all the data and different studies and information. And you kind of are left unfounded or a little bit unsure of what to do next in terms of the specific topic of improving your fertility. And we mostly dialed in on male fertility here. So we kind of want to just give our biggest takeaways of what just happened in this podcast and then provide some low-hanging fruits for you to start improving your fertility and overall health today. So what was your biggest takeaway? So honestly, biggest takeaway is don't settle. There are very obvious reasons why fertility is low, why hormones are low, and there are things you can do about it. Oh, definitely. I think that that's my biggest takeaway is like you aren't destined to feel bad. You aren't destined to be infertile. Your body was not designed to that way and your body can and wants to heal and there are steps forward. Definitely. Along the same line though, even if you're not planning on having a child within the next year, two years, three years, five years, being aware of the state of your hormonal health and your metabolism is so important and it goes beyond just you know, being able to have a child, which isn't really somebody's priority when they're in their young 20s or even mid 20s or low 30s if they're still really career driven or they're just not ready for that yet. But setting yourself up for success for when you are ready for it is so helpful and important. And even if you were to just go get some of the blood work that Georgie recommended just to kind of get a grasp on where you are, that really could be a good kick in the butt to kind of start improving some of these areas of your life to be in just overall better health. It's not just about having a child. It's about how healthy and good you feel every single day, how you're functioning, how you're feeling, what you're able to accomplish. It all goes hand in hand. And so I don't like when we approach the topic of fertility just from a standpoint of having a child because it goes so much deeper than that. Um, the state that your body is in, whether it feels safe enough and whether you have all of these different correct levels in balance is going to impact every other facet of your life. It's not just the ability to have a child. So that's kind of my biggest takeaway is that don't just wait until, you know, you and your partner are ready to start trying to make a family. You should probably get this information now and start changing your lifestyle now so you are better prepared in the future. I think another big takeaway is there's all these restrictive behaviors being pushed in the health sphere. And Sarah and I go back and forth on this, like, you know, ice baths and fasting. And like, Sarah's like, Ashley, like you, there's a time and place for these things. And I can see that, but a great point that Georgie brought up is, Hey, if your metabolic rate is already low, doing these restrictive things are just going to push your metabolic rate lower, digging you into a deeper stress hole, a deeper, like, state where you're going to have to dig yourself out eventually. So I, I think it's really important to assess. Like if you don't know where you're at right now, 
how do you know if you're moving forward in the future? And so I think taking a week, a month to dedicate to assessing the state of your health, I think that that can be super advantageous and can provide a clear path forward as to what is helping or hurting your health. Yeah. So those things we're talking about, so the more biohacking type remedies like the cold plunging and maybe even doing a little bit of fasting or whatever you want to call those things. Um, I think that context is so important. So like Ashley said, you should really know where you're at. And if you're somebody who is already under muscled, underweight, stressed, stressed, your first step should not be to go get into a cold plunge. Like that's really not going to move you in the right direction. It might provide like a temporary feeling of euphoria, but it's just not the first step you should take. And so context is important here though, because there are people who do benefit from a lot of these different therapies because you know, maybe it does help overall, you know, you feel better and lower your inflammation. I think everything's really coming down to inflammation. And if so, if some remedy is going to lower your inflammation, you're ultimately going to be off, better off in that moment. Um, and so that's where we kind of talked about this in the podcast where some of these things like, okay, let's say somebody does a 24 hour fast, for example, they've given maybe their gut, you know, enough time to take a break from the elevated endotoxin that might be in their system. Maybe they're having digestive stress. Maybe their diet <clears throat> is really not um, optimal. And so now this fast provided the period of time for the body to kind of lower inflammation. And so if you do this periodically, um, very with very good intention behind it, so we're not just doing this to lose weight, you know, which we, we did learn today, again, that losing weight can be very beneficial for lowering estrogen, lowering inflammation, improving your body composition. But if you were able to use these therapies that you might enjoy in the right time, in the right context, and at a you know frequency that is actually helping you, not hurting you, I do believe that they can be helpful. But it always comes down to, is that really your low-hanging fruit? I don't think anybody has like a cold therapy deficiency. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's more so like, what state of resilience are you already in? And from there, we can assess like, okay, would that, are you strong enough to handle that? Would that be something that actually does help you build more resilience? Or are you not ready for that kind of stuff and you really need to get your baseline to a better place? All right. Listen, if you enjoy these type of things and it legitimately does make you feel better, no one's telling you to stop. But like you said, it's not a necessary step. Yeah. I forward. mean, especially a first step. It's almost yeah. like, hey, you're at a really good place now. Let's go experiment. Yeah. And see, you know, what can really move the next needle forward for you? Because like we said, really, everything comes down to inflammation. And like, it's basically like, let's create the best internal bodily environment that we can. Yeah. And so if you're going to focus on those things, and I'm just going to say it right. I like those things. I find that there is cool benefits to using them in a smart way in the overall context of your life. But if you're not simultaneously focusing on every other thing in your life, trying to improve your metabolism, increase energy production, that is probably not a good match. Like you need to kind of do both. All right. So I'm going to play a would you rather with myself. Okay. Would you rather sit in a cold plunge or lay in the grass under sun? I'm going to choose the sun. Well, yeah, obviously. I know, but some people some people make the time for the cold plunge, but don't make the time for the sun. Possibly. You know? Possibly. But at the same time, like there are people who see Drastic, like our friend Morgan, for example, she started doing cold plunges and she saw drastic improvement in her rain odds, which is basically a very severe lack of blood flow to your extremities to the point where they start going numb, they turn white. And so Morgan overall, though, is low inflammation. She is very you know, resilient, to very resilient, following a good diet and, you know, does so many different things in her life to also move the needle forward. So it's not like a one and done. It's never one and done. Let's do cold plunge. Boom. Good, healthy. Yeah. So anyway. In the context of what was talked about today, cold plunging is definitely not the first step. Yeah. You, you just see these people <laughs> doing like 24 hour fast cold plunge. Don't eat until you've done X amount of cardio, like just extremes. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's so when it comes to dietary extremes, so I think there's a lot of um, push towards maybe a carnivore diet when it comes to, you know, how do we improve your testosterone? And I think that there's actually validity there in regards to eating more muscle meat, eating more protein. And completely flipping your fatty acid profile in your body. When you're eating muscle meat, you are consuming significantly more saturated fats than consuming plant-based proteins, which a lot of them are going to consume PUFAs. Yeah. So you're literally changing the internal environment of your body by what you're eating. Yeah. And possibly even beyond that, just 
overall, you're lowering your exposure to inflammatory components in foods like gums, um, different fillers, additives, natural or unnatural flavors, and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of benefits from going to a baseline. And what I bring this up to say, though, I never really think that that should be somebody's final stop. I think that we can use these different tools therapeutically to get to a better place you know, in one regard, but then we need to kind of think about what's next and what actually, what actually is health is health that we cannot ever tolerate any other foods or is health that we got ourselves to a good place to where we can start, you know, adding in different foods and our body is in the place to digest them, to assimilate the nutrients and to become more resilient. So I, the reason I bring that up is because I know that things, when, when we become afraid and, you know, we hear all this information, sometimes we go to that radical you know, huge shift elimination in our life and our diet. And while I do think, like I said, there is some validity to that, I do always caution somebody to have, you know, a more broad and inclusive end goal in mind and not just get stuck in this um, continuous, just continuous exposure and domino effect of more and more and more extreme and more, more elimination because you felt good. Because you always need to remember that your body thrives in abundance and it thrives with, you know, having challenges here and there, but overall having a sense of safety. And the way to um, foster that is to not encourage extreme restriction and feeling like you can't tolerate all these different things because if that's the case, then there is something deeper going on. It's not you. It's not that your body was uniquely made to just tolerate fruit or just tolerate meat. It's something else going on. And so that's kind of why we like to talk about all these different facets of, you know, diet, lifestyle, nutrition, exercise, environment, or nutrition and diet is the same thing, but because there are connections between them all and we have to look at the whole picture, especially when we're dealing with chronic illness. Ultimately, measure your body temperature and pulse and your free T3 levels and maybe cholesterol. No, to get the whole blubber get panel, George, the, you mentioned, especially yeah. and, most and if, people are t- listening to this for m- male fertility. Yes. Get the you know, cortisol, DHEA, testosterone, prolactin. total testosterone, prolactin, Estrogen. and then also measure your um, body temperature and pulse measurements. Like if you're chronically in the 96s, we need to get that up. And analyzing these metabolic parameters can help you gauge whether a certain activity, nutrition change, lifestyle change, uh, whatever change you make, whether it's moving you in the right direction. But I think it's always important to consider that these things take time. And yeah. so it's frequent analyzing and it's after a period of time. It's not just one day, yeah, two so, days. Um, we're going to go into some low-hanging fruits to tackle. And I d- just want to say that Ashley and I disagree on some things sometimes. And so it's fun to openly talk about it where we're recording it because I think maybe it's going to be useful to somebody who's having the same disagreements in their head. They're like, oh, but so-and-so said this, but I feel this, but this and this. Um, I just I just get jaded by restriction sometimes, you know. Yeah, that's yeah. A, that's just I, I guess. That. Just my- but you also have to recognize that people are struggling, and sometimes a baseline and a very simple diet can be helpful just to clear the noise while they figure out what to do. It's Ray Pete's um, think, perceive, no doubt. act, or no perceive. doubt, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, we we have to kind of simplify things for ourselves so we can think good enough to take the next step, and so. Um, anyways, some of the low hanging fruits, like you just mentioned, would be get your blood work, get your blood work and reduce like the easiest thing is to stop using chemicals on your skin. Like, I think that that's just like, like that is an activity that you can eliminate now. Yeah. This applies to both males and females. I think there was a week, like a, a really disgusting statistic that females use some horrific amount of endocrine endocrine disrupting chemicals on their skin every single day just from their makeup routine um so moving towards cleaner products so that would be deodorants body washes shampoos conditioners um toothpaste all these different things um and then reducing your PUFA consumption polyunsaturated fatty acids like literally the food you eat becomes in like it it forms the structures inside of you and fats have a really long half-life, like years. Yeah. And so any fats that are stored from your diet are literally impacting the internal environment of your body. And so I think that that's another low-hanging fruit. Like cut out the excessive nuts and seeds. If you enjoy those at a time, if you enjoy those 
have yeah, them you can on occasion. Properly them prepare them. Yeah, Weston A. Price uh, principles. But like cook with butter, tallow, and ghee. Yeah, maybe, Simple things like that. Maybe stop going out to eat as much. Maybe cooking your own meals is a good idea. Learning how to make food is like step one. I think that's a flex. I think that is something. Can you explain what that means? Yeah. So, well, I'm not into I don't know. Is that a hip go. term? I think. <laughs> that's a I would, flex? I would say that a flex is something that's like. Like, okay, so think about it when, like, you've got muscles, you're flexing on somebody that's like, you know, that's like, dang, look at that. So to me, cooking your own meals and knowing how to cook is a flex. It's something that I find very attractive. It's something that draws me to this person because I'm like, yeah, like, let's go. So would that be similar to, like, the term based? That's based? Um, I don't know. Okay. I honestly don't know. Just, like, I think it's so opposite of mainstream. <laughs> like, mainstream is so, like, quick, convenient, packaged food, going out to eat. Mm-hmm. And because food is somehow inconvenient, yeah. like, it's like a, oh, my God, I have to make my food today. Exactly. Like, what? That's my favorite part of the day. Um, I know. I mean, it can be daunting, but. Yeah. That's why being simple helps. Don't don't overthink it. Pick a protein. Pick a fat. Pick a carb. Boom. Done. Um. Another flex to me is like knowing where your food comes from. (laughs) So I think with those, I think with those two first steps, um, stopping your like toxic exposure and Mm -hmm. cooking your foods, I think that those are like for me the two lowest hanging fruits. Definitely, and just think about it this way: that when you lower inflammation, you are lowering the amount of enzymes that inhibit your liver to detoxify estrogen. And so that's where I feel like this is like just a huge component of inflammation and estrogen is when we have high inflammation, we actually are storing more estrogen. We have higher estrogen activity. It's making everything harder. So if we can figure out how to lower inflammation, I feel like the lowest hanging fruit for that is what you're putting inside your body on a regular basis, your diet. And so, yeah, like Ashley said, lowering PUFA consumption is definitely the first start. And then um, I don't, I wouldn't even go beyond that for diet right now. I feel like there's so many other things you can do first in your lifestyle and your environment that will move the move, move the needle forward a little bit more. So another thing for me would be if you're in the, a good enough health state is to start focusing on building muscle and not cardio. So prioritizing strength training um, in your environment, I would say that you need to kind of assess whether you're living in a clean environment. Maybe getting an air filter would be a good move. Lowering your exposure to molds and bacteria in your environment is a really good idea. Stop watching so much news because that yeah. is just like directly stress going into your body. Like that is something that you can reduce. I, I love like low hanging fruits that are things that you can stop doing, right? Because that's easier. That's an easier action item is to stop doing something than to add another thing to your busy schedule. And so like calling friends or talking to your community or doing something that will make you laugh is going to improve the internal state of your body more so than watching like hours and hours of news. Of course, it's important to stay informed as to what's happening, but like chronic news watching, especially given the state of the current world, like that is just a direct, like you are, your body is saying, okay, I'm just going to increase cortisol levels in my body. Oh, definitely. So lower, lower stress and get more sun. So yep. be outside more, uh, make sure you're getting enough vitamin D. Yeah. I feel and, like that's a really good start. And I feel like those are like the paramount things to nail down, really master Mm -hmm. before you can start getting lost in the weeds of minute details that aren't important. Yeah. And also before you start getting lost in like, what supplements should I take? It's like, yeah, let's not jump to supplements until we've optimized everything else. And I fully believe there's a time and place for supplements. Um, So I'm not saying don't take supplements, but let's do everything else first and then see where we're at. So, all right. This is the end of the Strong Sisters wrap up almost 20 minute ramble until (laughs) next time stay rooted in resilience